Hello, welcome to the Capital Employed Podcast. Joining me in conversation for this episode was Evan Blecker from NetNet Hunter. As the name NetNet Hunter suggests, Evan is a huge advocate of deep value investing. He is also the author of the popular book, Benjamin Graham's NetNet Stock Strategy, which was published last year by Harriman House. In this episode, Evan gives an overview of NetNet Hunter and his investment philosophy. He also talks about two stocks he's invested in, which he thinks are being very undervalued by the market. I really enjoy listening to him and I think you will too. Before we jump into this week's episode, make sure to add your email to the Capital Employed email list. We will be publishing some exclusive interviews that will only be available to those on the list. To receive these bonus episodes, visit capitalemployedfm forward slash exclusive and add your email to the list. Without further interruption, please enjoy my conversation with Evan. Hi, Evan. Thanks for coming on to the podcast. Hey, great to be here. Can you tell the listeners what is NetNet Hunter and what is the investment philosophy strategy behind it? So I guess we'll start with the investment uh, philosophy first. If you think about a low price to book stock and then you strip out the long term assets from the equation, you get a net net. In the old days, they used to use uh, price to book as kind of a liquidation value or net asset value of of a company. It's a little more, a little less relevant these days, but uh, the net net approach is still very relevant. What you end up getting is a hyper conservative valuation. So what you get is basically a hyper conservative assessment of the company's liquidation value, and that's what we're going for. We're trying to buy the companies basically. Uh, as cheaply as we possibly can. And it doesn't get any more cheaper than looking at a company's liquidation value, conservative liquidation value, and then buying well below it. Most companies don't trade at that level. We're looking at basically micro cap and nano caps. While most investors think that a $1 billion company is a small company, we're looking at companies all the way from a million to 300 million. So it's a million dollars in U.S. Uh, market cap to all the way to 300 million in, in U.S. market cap. And the reason that we like to look there is because when you go to these smaller companies, you look at the, when you're looking at the nano and the micro cap, no matter what strategy you're using, you're always going to find uh, that those areas of the market is far less efficient than, you know, your large and your mid cap space. You have uh, a lot fewer professionals looking there. And the competition tends to be a lot less sophisticated. So that's why that's why you tend to find net nets there. And that tends to be where the returns are, if you're a small individual investor anyways. So after we find uh, something that looks promising, we stick it into a portfolio with a lot of other names uh, that are similar in quality and cheapness. We let the portfolio returns kind of carry... Uh, carry the day. We don't focus too much on what happens to an individual stock because it's kind of a statistical strategy. So, you know, you put a bunch of these into a portfolio and then, you know, hopefully the portfolio as a whole does well. Nanet Hunter is a tool that I built for my own investing. I started the strategy in about 2010, about three years later after the Great Depression or sorry, the great, <laughs> the great recession. It felt like a depression back then, but definitely a recession. These opportunities kind of started drying up in the U.S. I mean, they're still there, but what was there was uh, just absolute garbage. We're talking about Chinese uh, reverse merger scams and stocks that were, you know, they're losing more in, or they had more in losses than they had in yearly revenue. So <laughs> not quite the best companies to invest in. Uh, So what I ended up doing was um, building a tool that would help us source these companies internationally. By increasing the pool of candidates, we could increase the quality of the stocks in our portfolio. And uh, in order to uh, fund that cost, I ended up creating a website and making it a membership or a subscription website. Now we have uh, a fairly hardcore group of deep value investors that you know, combing through the list of, say, a thousand uh, international net nets that we've uncovered, 
in order to find the very best uh, of the bunch to invest in. And then, you know, we talk about it on the site, learning resources and, you know, all the rest of it. And the list that gets compiled, would, would it be focused on a few key quantitative uh, metrics? Yeah, I mean, we have two lists. And so what we want to do is we want to have the largest number of net nets possible that we can find. And we'll stick that into a list and we call that our raw screen. So it's just a bulk list of stocks that meet the criteria. And the criteria, roughly speaking, is you have to have a market cap, you have to have a net current asset value, and the market cap has to be below the net current asset value. So the net current asset value is what I was talking about before. It's your book value uh, without including the fixed assets or the long-term assets. So we have a list of about a thousand of those uh, from various countries around the world, uh, a lot in Asia, uh, a lot in the West, actually, a lot in Hong Kong. Then we have a second screen, and this is uh, where the magic happens. <laughs> Basically, our analyst goes through the raw screen by hand and takes a look at all the companies in there in order to exclude the bulk of them. And then we focus on, say, 5 to 10% that kind of meet our stricter standards. The stricter standards come down to buyability, whether they have significant operations uh, or headquarters in China or not. We try to exclude China due to fraud reasons. Yeah, we look for stability. So uh, we don't want a company that's, you know, wasting away its net current asset value too quickly. We try to avoid companies that are selling shares. We try to exclude uh, certain industries that aren't conducive to good net net investments. And so what you have is you have about 10, 5 to 10 percent of the raw screen compiled into a short list. That's the list where if you were putting together uh, a net net portfolio for the first time or you had a little bit of time uh, to spend picking your investments, you would want to focus on those stocks because those are the net nets with the best, I'd say the best probability of working out well. So, I mean, it's your, it's your pool of companies that are, you know, among the highest prospects that you can find. Actually, I just went through last month, I went through the entire raw screen by hand myself, just to see what was there. I could find um, not a whole lot. There's some bits and pieces where if you're an expert, you can identify the better opportunities among excluded stocks, but uh, the bulk is on the short list. So, and can you talk through two companies that you've recently come across that you feel will have uh, good returns over the next year or so? Yeah, sure. So, again, you know, before I get into any companies or picks, I want to stress that this is definitely a statistical approach to investing, and a lot of newer investors, and definitely I have this problem look at investing as um, focusing on individual companies. And the shift that a lot of people have to make is rather than look at individual companies and emphasizing the return on those companies, you really need to do it on a portfolio basis. You know, we're investing in companies and, uh, you know, any one company might not work out, especially in the net net or the deep value space. But you hope that your selection criteria is good enough in your judgment is good enough that the average return on those companies that you pick in your portfolio, stuff in your portfolio, that they'll do fairly well. And so it's the portfolio returns that matter. Having said that, I think that some net nets are better than others. And so uh, I identified two that I think are particularly good. One that I've owned for a while and another one that I just picked up in the last couple of months. The first one is a little jewelry retailer in Singapore. I think about half of my portfolio tends to be international, but this company is called TLV Holdings. They're a little retailer. They sell uh, jewelry. They had obviously a pretty terrible 2020 because of the pandemic. The stock was beaten down all the way to, I don't know, something insanely cheap like. Uh, maybe a third of uh, net current asset value or 40% of net current asset value. So in other words, it's trading at between 60 and 75% discount to, to liquidation value. So it's very, very cheap. 
interestingly enough, the company actually opened stores in 2020. So it was confident enough in its future that it actually st- tried to grow the business. You know, just going off memory here, I think they expanded the store base by about 10%. One thing to note about this company is that they do have a decent amount of debt. I think the debt to equity ratio is about 40%. So it's a little higher in debt than I would like for a troubled company. On the other hand, it definitely seems like a solid company. It's uh, it's managed by what seem like good, respectable people. And I think it's only a matter of time before things pick up for the company. One of the key drivers to the performance over the next 12 months or 24 months, we'll say, is that half of their business comes from international exhibitions. So these are jewelry shows, basically. It's, you know, obviously with the 2020 pandemic, there was no exhibitions. Everybody was closed. Everything was canceled. So half of their business was basically wiped out in 2020. It stands to reason that these exhibitions are going to come back, if not in 2021, they're going to come back in 2022 when the pandemic is basically gone. And when that happens, you know, the company gets half of its business back and the stock uh, should recover. So that's, uh, that's the first one, TLV Holdings in Singapore. The second one is a company called Playmates Toys. This company is based in Hong Kong. I'm sure that a lot of uh, people have heard the ner- uh, the name Playmates. It's obviously a kid's toy company. Uh, they've transitioned a little bit. They own basically licensing rights to produce toys for a range of kids shows and for a couple blockbuster movies coming coming out this year. Now, the company, when I picked it up, was trading at, I think it was 25 Hong Kong cents, I believe. And it's moved up a little bit. Uh, I think it's sitting at about 38 now. So it's it's gone up a fair amount, but it's still very, very cheap. The last I looked, it was sitting at about about 45% of net current asset value. So less than uh, it's priced at less than half of its conservative liquidation value. And most of that is cash. So you look at the company's balance sheet, most of the assets that the company has, the bulk of them are in cash and it has very little in the way of liabilities. So you subtract the cash from the total liabilities of the company and you get an amount that uh, exceeds the market cap. So that's kind of interesting. When you buy the company, uh, you're technically taking ownership of more cash than you're shelling out. Another thing that's interesting about this company is that it's transitioned into this licensing model. And so they own licenses to produce toys for the upcoming Godzilla vs. Kong movie that's uh, released, I think, actually, I think it's just been released on the 25th of March. That should be interesting. Now, if that movie does well, and as a result, you know, people want toys from the movie, which, you know, tends to be what happens, Playmates should make a lot more sales. The bottom line should improve dramatically, and that might cause the stock to take off. It also has another movie, or it also has the licensing rights for toys for another movie that's coming out. I believe it's at the end of 2021, and this is a new Turtles movie. So we have at least two blockbuster movies in 2021, possibly more 2022. If any of those are a big success and lead to large toy sales, then Playmates is going to do significantly better. If you look back over the past five years, it was trading above $2 a share. To get back there, <laughs> it has a ways to go. But, you know, it, anything's possible. It could trade up back and around there. But uh, I think the net current asset value on that one is about about $0.80. Cents. Still a ways to go upward. And those are basically the two that I like. Uh, if you like them, just make sure that you're fitting them into a well-diversified portfolio because these are troubled companies, right? These are companies that bad things have happened to their business and they've seen price declines of, you know, 90% over two, three year period. Their sales have um, definitely been crushed and that's what creates these uh, huge buying opportunities. Thanks for sharing those two. I think they sound both really interesting. Yeah, not a problem. Uh, I wanted to talk to you about books now, just to close out uh, the episode. 
you wrote a book called Benjamin Graham's Net Net Stock Strategy, which seems um, yes. very popular on Amazon. I take it you're a keen reader too. And if so, what book have you read recently that you really enjoyed? Well, that's a really good question. Uh, yeah, the, the Benjamin Graham's Net Net Stocks came out in, I think it was June 20, 2020. So yeah, that's that's been doing really, really, really well. Uh, in terms of my own reading, I haven't really read a lot of books recently that pertain to investing. I think I've kind of hit the 20% or, you know, the, you know, the old 80, 20 rule where 80% of your results come from 20% of your actions. I think I'm there with reading about value investing. What I like to get into now are very, very niche topics in the value investing space, and they tend to be very obscure, but also hugely valuable. So maybe I'll, I'll give a couple of those. Well, everybody knows Warren Buffett, and everybody knows that Warren Buffett had a partnership in the, in the 60s. Well, before his partnership, he was a private investor. He just met Graham. The 50s were actually the best period of performance for his, uh, for his entire life. So uh, he earned the highest compound annual growth rate in the 50s before he even started managing money professionally. So that sounds pretty surprising because, you know, everybody these days tends to be a buffeteer and they're um, trying to buy the best companies out there with moats and all that. It's not actually the best way to go if you're a small individual investor. And Buffett says that in a couple areas. In the 50s, Buffett wrote a number of articles for, I think it was called the Financial Chronicle. If you go out uh, onto the web and you do a bunch of digging, you can actually find uh, some of these articles. They're very, very insightful in terms of what he was doing because they're write-ups on companies that he was uh, he had the highest conviction in. So, you know, obviously these are going to be the companies that Buffett thinks that uh, will do the best, relatively speaking, versus other other companies going forward. They're the best buys, basically. These are the type of companies that Buffett would be buying now if, um, you know, if he was only managing a million to 10 million. You get write-ups on Western Insurance, uh, securities company, Geico's in there. There's an oil company in there. These writings are scattered here and there, but we also have them available for download on, on NetNet Hunter for free. Um, so if you want to read those, I highly recommend uh, going and getting that download off of NetNet Hunter. So that's, that's definitely one that uh, I would read. And then I tend to watch lectures and podcasts. And I found one about Lee Lu recently. I'm not sure what university he was giving this lecture at. Um, it, it was probably Columbia, actually, now that I think about it. But he talks about the investments that he made when he was first starting out. And these were kind of the highest, uh, most, or highest performing most loved investments, you know, of his career, because these are the ones he's talking about now. And, you know, and all these uh, warm feelings are coming back. And this is available on YouTube. So if you search for Lee Lu and you search for Columbia Lecture, uh, I think it was 2006. I could be wrong, but I think it was 2006. He'll talk about the oil company that uh, he bought. Uh, and he'll talk about buying Timberland, uh, the shoe company, uh, for basically what was net net or sub liquidation value, but he'll he'll talk about all these companies that and what he looked for in them that made them such exceptional values. And why I'm bringing this up along with the Buffett is because you know Li Lu is probably the best uh, investor or the best modern investor that we have. He has one of the best uh, records in investing, and arguably he's beating Buffett's old record during a period where stocks are a lot more expensive. So, so outperforming the market is just harder. His strategy that he used when he first started out was exactly what Buffett was using when Buffett stra uh, started out. So you kind of take, you know, you take Buffett's readings, you take Lee Lu's um, commentary on his past picks, you put it together and you come up with an outstanding investment strategy. And this is kind of the way, this is kind of the direction that I've wanted to take or I've, I'm trying to take my own investing. But, you know, obviously you're not going to find these exceptional values in the large cap space, you really have to go for extremely beaten down micro and nano caps, 
preferably in international markets. And so, yeah, that's, that's what I would recommend. Where can listeners go to find out more about NetNet Hunter and about yourself? So NetNet Hunter, uh, just go to netnethunter.com and you can read uh, tons of free content on there. You can read about me. We do have a free email newsletter if you're interested. If not, no problem. Uh, if you're interested in NetNets but you don't want anything to do with me or NetNet Hunter, I would recommend uh, picking up Benjamin Graham's NetNet stock strategy on Amazon. I think that is, uh, well, it's the only comprehensive uh, book on the subject. There are other books on the subject, but um, not nearly as deep, thorough, or practical. Okay, and thanks so much for coming on to the show. It's been a pleasure to listen to you. It's great talking to you.